um, I'm going to uh, hand you over to Jamie Hewland, okay, who's doing deploying Django web applications in Docker containers. Take it away, Jamie. Hi, thanks. Uh, okay. Um, I'm Jamie. I'm an SRE at prickout.org. Um, I've been working on Docker containers for Python software for a couple of years now. Um, here are some of my <laughs> uh, social media. Um, right. So at prickout.org, basically, we moved to containers because we needed to deploy a lot of sites very quickly. And basically, manu manually managing Python processes across a whole bunch of servers was not scaling. Um, so we produce a lot of sites like this, um, especially around uh, healthcare and youth, um, which are uh, quite specific to different countries um, across Africa and Asia. Um, yeah. So uh, this is roughly what I'm going to try and speak about. Um, Firstly, just very brief introduction to what are Docker containers. Um, and I'm going to talk about specifically running Docker containers inside a container orchestration system. So I'm going to try and explain that a bit. And then I'll talk about how Django is normally deployed without containers. And then how is it done in a container. OK, containers and container orchestration, they're quite fashionable at the moment. Um, what is a Linux container, roughly speaking? Um, basically, it's a way of isolating a process's view of its operating environment using namespaces. So a process can only see its own process trees, its own user IDs, and networks. Um, it basically has its own world. Uh, then we also want to limit and prioritize resources so we can define limits on the amount of CPU or memory that a container uses. Um, and other resources. Uh, Docker containers, specifically, Docker is just an implementation of container technology. Um, it's probably the most popular. Um, it really caught on because it was one of the first container technologies that was very easy to use. It kind of included a lot of functionality out of the box. Um, it has this fancy thing called copy on write union file system, which is basically means that the containers can start up very quickly and they can share a lot of image data between each other due to this copy on write file system. Um, and images are available, Docker images, for all the software. Um, so essentially, anything you might want to run, you can sort of run in one command, given that you're willing to wait a while for a download, for the whole image to download. Um, yeah. Uh, and then just a note on kind of Docker terminology. Um, you start out with a Docker file, which is just a simple text file that defines a number of steps you use to build your Docker image. Um, your Docker image is kind of like a snapshot of a container. You can think of it a bit like a snapshot of a VM, say. Um, and then when you run the image, you have a container. Um, unfortunately, the terms image and container are kind of conflated quite often, and I'm going to carry on doing that. Um, yeah. Uh, so why would you want to use containers? Um, basically, what I like to call kind of consistent portability. It's a very clean way to package your software together with basically everything it could need to run. Um, and it's very easy to run because there's a single simple entry point to start your container. You can once it's running, you can limit the accesses to resources on the machine. And kind of in theory, it eliminates this but it works on my machine. Why doesn't it work in production? It runs the same way everywhere because it's a very consistent way of packaging your software. Right. So container orchestration. Um, I googled container orchestration, and the first result is this pretty good uh, blog post, which you should read. And I've copied the definition because I couldn't come up with a better one. But it basically refers to the automated arrangement, uh, coordination, and management of software containers. And this is basically achieved through a bunch of automated services, things like service discovery, how does one container know how to reach another container, uh, load balancing, how do you, uh, say, split requests between multiple containers, uh, health checks, how do you make sure the container running is still healthy, 
uh, and resource management. How do you allocate different resources to different containers? And there's more and more and more. Um, container orchestration is <laughs> very fashionable. There's lots of different services you can use. Uh, Kubernetes is probably the one with the most kind of momentum at the moment, I think. Uh, HashiCorp's got Nomad. And there's Mesosphere DCOS, which is what we use in particular. Then Docker itself comes with kind of a built-in container orchestration called Docker Swarm. And then all the cloud providers have their own thing you can use. Um, right. This is roughly what our container orchestration system looks like. Um, we use the terminology uh, controller and worker. Um, the controllers basically tell the workers what to do and you have this big pool of some number of workers. And then outside of that, if we break that down, um, we've basically got these stateful services that kind of sit outside um, because it is a little tricky to deploy uh, stateful things in containers. Um, and you take a bit of a performance hit for things like Postgres inside a container. Um, so yeah, that kind of is the setup. Right. Why might you want to do this? Well, first of all, deployments are pretty cool. Um, this person's like, I want to run my container. Yes, I don't care how. It's kind of passive aggressive. But the controller is like, yeah, I can do this. And it just finds a worker. You don't have to care about which worker it's going to run on. Um, yeah. Another thing is failover. OK, worker one not having a good day. Um, something goes wrong. and. Uh, the system notices this and just migrates the containers automatically off onto different workers. Uh, scaling, okay, so you're running two instances of some container and now you're like, I want to run three. And the controller just finds your, your worker, runs the container, um, and then various services within the cluster will also uh, manage that. So. Say, for instance, a load balancer might start routing requests to this extra new container. Um, and then resource utilization. This was actually a pretty big reason why we decided to move to a container orchestration system, because we weren't making very good use of the hosts we had. Um, so you have this container in mind, and you define how much CPU you want to give it, uh, how much RAM, and then you, know, you don't have to think about where this is going to fit on which server. Uh, you tell your container orchestration system, this is what my container needs, and it finds a place for it. And it roughly balances the containers across those workers and makes sure resources are used efficiently. Right, so I'm going to step back a bit and start <laughs> trying to put some Python in here and talking about Django itself. Um, so Django, you may have heard of it. The previous talk in this room was about it, and there have been several about it. Um, it's really popular. And it has lots of features, lots of third-party extensions. Um, yeah. So actually running Django, you typically deploy it using a WSGI server. It stands for the Web Server Gateway Interface, so, which is defined in PEP 3333, however many threes. And it, WSGI basically defines these two sides. There's the server, server and gateway side, and then there's this like, application framework. Um, and basically, the server receives requests and uh, it calls the application with data from the request. Uh, when I say call, literally just like a Python calling the software. Um, GUnicorn is such a WSGI server, it's quite popular. Uh, it's based on some Ruby software called Unicorn, and it has this um, pre-fork worker model where basically one master process uh, spawns some worker processes. The worker processes actually serve the requests. And the master basically just, uh, it's pretty brute force. It just like terminates a worker if it takes too long. Um, and you have some number of worker processes doing this. And this design is very simple, but it's designed to only serve fast clients. Um, so if we look at this, uh, we have various unicorn workers kind of all just waiting on the shared socket. Um, but they expect these requests to come in quickly. So we need this reverse proxy in front of GUnicorn to make our client to deal with our slow clients um, and buffer the request. Um, the most common software used as a reverse proxy uh, for this kind of application is Nginx. And this is you know very fast web server, battle tested. Um, 
And on top of that, we can use it to do other useful things, um, like you can serve the static files for a Django application, you can do some basic caching, compression, HTTPS, etc. Right, then, to add another piece to this, we have Celery. And because Django under Unicorn is only running in response to requests, if you want to do any kind of long-running tasks, you need a separate thing to do that, which is Celery. Um, and Celebrity is a distributed task queue, and it has very nice, uh, simple integration with Django. But in order to queue jobs for Celery to do, you need a message broker. Right. Other things you'd need for Django, obviously a database. Um, it's probably going to be PostgreSQL. Um, and then you might want to hook it up to some caching, which you can use either Redis or Memcached. Um, right, how does this whole thing roughly look? Nginx in the front receives the requests, sends them through to Django. Django uh, speaks to the database. It also queues tasks for Celery to pick up. Um, Celery worker kind of works on the long running tasks. And then Celery beat is a bit like a cron thing. It basically runs scheduled tasks. Right, so usually this is deployed by kind of just taking all of that and just put it on a box somewhere, and that's your server. Um, right, so you've got web server one, great, it's running all the things, um, and then you find that you need to scale a little bit, and you end up breaking out the database, and maybe you want you know, your database to not be lost when something goes wrong, so you add a replica, uh, then you break out a bit more, you're finding that Celery is using a lot of resources, uh, so you break that out, um, and then Okay, and then you want to run, you know, maybe multiple of these uh, Django G Unicorn instances. So you need a load balancer in front of that, and you can scale like this. But we've gone from one server to basically ten or more quite quickly. Right. So, um, how can we do this using containers? Uh, right. You'll never guess what we tried first when we tried to put Django in a container. We took most of that and basically just put it in a container, um, swapping out one or two things. Uh, please do not do this. Um, this is kind of really abusive Docker containers. They're, they're not meant to be used like mini VMs. They're meant to isolate processes, not really entire services. Um, it makes good health checks very difficult. If you're going to send a health check to this container, what are you checking if you have five different things running? Um, also, Docker containers don't have uh, programs to manage multiple processes because there's no init system. Um, and also, container orchestration systems basically expect containers to be ephemeral and fail fast. If something goes wrong, your container just stops and the container orchestration system starts it somewhere else. Right, so this is roughly what we've settled on, and you can kind of think of this as like the Python processes are in the containers, and then stateful things are outside this work pool and don't run in containers. Um, so we have basically three containers. Uh, there's the Django container, Celery Worker, and Celery Beat, and we can scale the Django container, the number of instances of that, and the number of Celery Worker containers we run. Right, so a few notes on how to get Django working in, a con in containers. Um, don't want to build a Docker image with all the config files inside it. It's very tempting to do this because then you have kind of everything inside your container and it's all neat and packaged. But every time you want to reconfigure, then you have to rebuild the image um, and you start having like passwords in your Docker image, which means that you have to be very careful about how you deal with your Docker image. Um, so it's, it's difficult to move configuration files around with containers because they're bouncing around this like pool of workers all the time. Um, so generally, the solution is to have your Django settings module read config from the environment variables. Uh, there's a package called Django Environ that makes this quite nice. Um, you can define lots of things kind of in s single environment variables, like all your database settings, um, and it handles some things like converting environment variables into, say, booleans or integers. Um, yeah, and the it's kind of just an example from your settings file for Django. Um, right, and then another thing you commonly see in Docker containers is a startup script. And these basically do some basic setup when your container starts somewhere in the cluster. So you might want to 
run your database migrations, uh, create a super user account the first time you're ever setting the particular Django app up, um, set some default arguments, you want to switch to a non-root user. Um, you can do all kinds of things in these startup scripts and it's kind of tempting to just add more kind of automation, but you end up with these kind of unwieldy bash scripts, so you probably want to keep it simple most of the time. Um, and then logging. So since containers are ephemeral, you don't typically log in the same way you would on a server because as soon as your container goes away, so do all the log files. And most of the time, you basically just log everything to standard out or standard error. And the container orchestrator you use will collect, generally collect this and make it very easy to look up the logs for a given container. Um, right, and this is another reason that it becomes even more important that you don't run like five things in your container because then you have multiple things kind of streaming to standard out and standard error and you can't determine what's going on. Um, and on top of that, it'd be really good if you can make your logs machine readable because you have quite limited uh, way of uh, dealing with logs. Right, uh, Django also has this concept of uh, user uploaded files which can be stored in sort of a media directory and you shouldn't really do this uh, for various security reasons whether you're using containers or not but it's extra hard if you have to uh, manage like networked storage to store these media files along with your containers. Um, use something like Django storages and have your media files uploaded to S3 rather. Um, right, so we built this base image called, that we call Django Bootstrap. It has nothing to do with CSS Bootstrap. Um, and it's basically the standardized J Docker image that we use for pretty much all our Django deployments. Um, and it has uh, this Nginx configuration that's optimized for Django specifically in a container. We can do some kind of clever things if we know what's running uh, in the container. Um, has startup scripts for Django and Celery that do all the things I've described. And we test it, which I think is, is pretty cool. I don't think most people kind of like test their Nginx configuration, but we do. Um, and that's the GitHub repo if you want to see it. Um, and this is basically what your Docker file might look like if you were using this image. Um, so you start out with a Django bootstrap image, you copy in your source code and install it. Then we set some basic things like we define where the Django settings is and w what the Celery app will be. Then we run collect static so that our, files are ready to, our static files are ready to be served by Nginx. And then we tell GUnicorn what our application is. Right. Um, there's still further improvements we think we can make to this image. Um, firstly, you're still running more than one thing in the container, which is not good. Um, and the solution we have to this is basically what's called a pod, which I think is a concept that Kubernetes started with, where you essentially have uh, multiple containers that you define as co-located. So these containers need to run on the same worker host at the same time. Um, and once you can do that, uh, you can share storage volumes between two containers. So you can share the static volume as well as the volume to share the Unix socket so that Nginx can speak to GUnicorn. Um, configuration secrets. We're now putting all these passwords in environment variables, but environment variables can get leaked. Um, for example, if you have like debug mode on in Django, these things can show up quite easily. Um, so depending on which container orchestration platform you're using, you may have some system that will securely handle passwords for you. Um, these often involve, uh, say, mounting a file within the container. Um, and that file is securely handled and contains the passwords. Um, then going kind of a step further, uh, which is really like an entirely separate talk, and my colleague is working on this, um, there's a product from HashiCorp called Vault that will actually create things like database credentials that only live as long as a container. Um, so whenever your container starts up somewhere else in the cluster, it has a completely new set of credentials. Um, Right, another thing we'd like to do is start providing some basic metrics from the Nginx uh, that we have configured for Django. Um, we've been investigating the system that uh, produces uh, metrics for Prometheus, um, and we can kind of optimize this again for Django because we know what this Nginx is doing. Um, 
well, at least what it's being used for. Um, so you can kind of, by updating uh, the Nginx that we use for all our Django deployments, we can kind of, in a way, get, um, we can basically get sort of free metrics for all our apps. Um, but uh, you probably should still properly instrument your Django application and actually implement metrics within the Django app that are a little bit more detailed and specific. Um, yeah, so in conclusion, containers are cool. Uh, yeah, so containers and container orchestration systems can introduce a bunch of complications. Um, it's very difficult, or well, depending on your platform, it can be quite difficult to have persistent storage for containers um, because your containers are moving about, but moving the data with them can be, can be quite difficult depending on, you know, if you have like quite a fancy network file system, maybe it's not too difficult. Um, generally, you don't have config files, uh, just defining all your config environment variables. Uh, you generally don't have log files as well. And you want to try and run one thing per container, and it's quite different from uh, the old model of just running lots of things on a web server. Um, you can't really SSH into a container because it doesn't have SSH, um, and so often it's quite a complicated process to uh, get from where you are to somewhere where the container is running on the cluster. Um, and it's a, you're implementing basically a distributed system and everything that comes with that. Uh, so there can be lots of complications and interesting failure modes in these systems. Um, yeah, but they have some advantages, which I've pretty much outlined already, but easy deployments, scaling, can make more efficient use of your resources. Uh, and you generally have an increased level of automation. Um, and you have your apps are now consistently packaged, and whether you're running Django or something completely different, if it's a container, you can run it on the platform. Um, and then finally, just overall containers for Django, I think having a kind of common base image has worked quite well for us, and we can provide a bunch of advantages. Um, we have this tested and opt optimized server config. Um, we can encapsulate the best practices. So for instance, I work on the SRE team, but the people developing the Django applications can be on a different team, and we, we as the SRE team can define our best practices for everybody else to use by providing this base image. And essentially, most devs don't have to worry about a lot of these optimizations. Um, and like I've said, a uh, consistent platform for deploying these apps. And uh, what I like is also the potential for adding new features. So if we change things in the space image, we add some new functionality, we can do that often without really involving other teams too much. Um, and because this image is used across so many of our applications, we can kind of upgrade all of them at once, in theory. And yeah. <laughs> Questions? Hi. You mentioned uh, logging and keeping the files is an issue. What, how do you deal with, with logs at the moment? Um, getting Gunicon to write, uh, getting Django to write to stand it out and then capturing those logs? Um, yeah, so Django uses a pretty standard sort of Python logging configuration. So you have that like big hash of config. And um, yeah, you just need to define your various Python loggers to log to standard out and standard error. Um, different uh, container orchestration systems will have different ways of dealing with this. But for instance, on DCOS, there's kind of like this web UI. You just log in and you go click on your application and it can stream the standard out and standard error like in the web UI. Is that answer? DC, DC OS, or what, what, what's the... Sorry? DC OS, or what, what, what streams the logs? Uh, well, it's Mesos under the hood at Flash and Mesos, yeah. Cool. Thank you. Um, by the yeah. way, thank you for this Docker image. I have used it for <laughs> over a year, and it saved my life so many times. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> first of all, thank you. Um, the and also thank you for documenting stuff. Most do Docker files are full of just theory, and yours actually has 
good information. You learn something reading your read me. Um, now I've done kissing your ass. Um, <laughs> how do you best handle um, instances where, like a Django project can often start simple and then suddenly you need something like image magic because somebody wants to resize images on the fly. What's, um, what's a good way of expanding once you start installing packages that are where you've got something that's not just pip install in your setup.py? Sure. Um, yeah, uh, there have been a few cases where people have come to me and been like, I want to do this thing. Like there was one point where somebody wanted to uh, take uh, screenshots of a mobile of the website, like from the website, which involved like installing WebKit and Qt and all these things. And I was like, at a certain point, you have to be like, no, you can't add this to the image. You need to build a separate system to do this. Um, as far as just the pip install stuff goes, um, firstly, we've done a bunch of effort um, in the image that Django Bootstrap is based on includes a number of scripts that makes installing packages um, correctly in Docker containers um, easier. Uh, on top of that, we've built a bunch of framework that um, precompiles uh, some common uh, Python packages and serves wheels of those um, so that you don't need build tools inside the, the uh, your Docker image. Um, yeah, and I guess it's it's the kind of thing where we just have to um, SRE team needs to work with the devs and kind of come to some some system that works. If that answers. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So just one thing about that, like having the build system in in the image in the new Docker, there's a feature where you can use a build image and then the image that ends up running. So you can actually build your dependencies, copy them over, but they don't become part of the actual image that you distribute. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, sorry, so that was just a comment. Um, in terms of a question, I noticed that you run your Celery and your Django <coughs> on separate images, um, but I assume that has to share the same application code, or how do you do that? Uh, it's the same image, uh, so there it would still be using the Django Bootstrap image. Um, we just change the command that the container is running. So instead of the unicorn command, it's the Celery command. Um, and like I said, there's an entry point script for Celery in this container as well. Um, yeah, as far as the the Docker, I think they call it build stages goes. Um, we actually haven't used that too much yet, and it's it's a bit tricky in terms of like caching the image layers because most of the time you don't want to be rebuilding from scratch every time um, and yeah it's kind of a work in progress Let's see. I was actually gonna um, point out a, a similar thing um, Glyph has this article on uh, building um, docker images with Python uh, which I, I think is from 2015. Um, if, if you search for Glyph Docker build, you'll you'll find that, and it talks about using a split build and run image. Um, it doesn't use the special Docker image, yeah. but it, it's it's a similar idea where you have like one image which has all your build tools, all your complicated big dependencies, and that effectively just builds and spits out all the wheels and static things you need, which you then put in your runtime image. And it's actually like not very hard to just wire that up yourself. Yeah, like actually. Yeah, um, when we started doing Docker containers for Python, that is exactly what my colleague Jeremy implemented. Um, and we did that for a while, but it becomes more complicated because you have to maintain this build image as long as, as well as the runtime image, and you have to develop this process that will build the wheels. Um, and I think we found a better system was to have our continuous integration build the wheels inside a container, upload, because you can you can upload wheels um, to a PyPy server, PyPI, um, and you can download those wheels and they will run on your platform provided that 
um, the build environment is identical to the runtime environment. And because we use the containers both to build and run, we have a consistent build and runtime environment. So it's almost like a separate talk. <laughs> Um, basically, what we did was we started there and incrementally increased the separation until we ended up with basically two completely different things that were mostly unrelated. So, yeah. same idea, just more and more separation over time. Uh, thank you for an awesome presentation. I <laughs> sure. uh, just wanted to ask you about uh, Django and Docker, using it together. Um, when you normally, when you, you have the management commands, and what I normally would do is I would go in SSH into the, onto the server and then run some random, sh uh, you know, go into the shell for instance, do, yeah. do some stuff or run uh, custom management commands. But since you can't SSH into the machine, how do you handle that? Um, well, <laughs> this, th yeah, this has been a problem, um, where people build something and then they're like, oh, I need to change just this one thing and run this one Django admin command and it will fix everything. And we're like, no, you can't really do that. Um, the, I think the first step is like getting people to build their application in such a way so that this is not required. Um, at least try that. Um, Kubernetes, for example, although we don't use it, provides some tools to kind of um, run things like this. You run kind of once-off commands um, before your container runs. Uh, and yeah, it's a, <laughs> it's a bit tricky. Yeah. Um, I can also respond to, to that. Um, the thing we found was the easiest is to uh, um, package your Django application as a Python package and expose the manage.py as the, as the console entry point or the entry point script. So then in Docker, you can just run docker exec, yeah. your image name, and your application name, and then the management command. I didn't quite understand your answer to the first question about that extra service. So if we're taking something like image resizing, you suggested that you build a separate application to deal with that. Um, so how would that really work? Would you um, sort of, you know, on your website, you have some kind of uh, upload, and then it takes that upload and does a whole bunch of magic, sends it to another application, and then sends it back? Is that what you were saying? Uh. Not exactly. I think the original question was more around you start adding, I guess, more and more packages to your Docker image and things like image magic that do all kinds of things and require all kinds of, they have like huge lists of dependencies. Um, yeah, I, <laughs> I don't, uh, yeah, I don't really know what the best way to implement, say, image resizing would be for this particular application. Um, I'm tempted to say like you'd use a salary worker to try and uh, do that asynchronously, but that may not be acceptable depending on the application. Um, yeah, you can, um, like the example I showed was very, yeah, this is, this is very simple. Like you can do pip install other things, you can do apt get install other things in this process. This is just kind of the simplest example. Um, so you can, but ideally you yeah, don't want a hugely complex thing running in your container. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, so you mentioned <laughs> that you run stuff like your like RabbitMQ and Postgres separately. Can you maybe just tell a bit more about what's the issues of running them in a container and like how do you then end up running them? Sure. Um, okay, well, first of all, there are definitely people running these things in containers, like <laughs> can be done. Um, uh, primarily for us, the issue is the persistent storage. So, you know, running Postgres in a container that bounces around this cluster and then you need like a networked file system so that the 
you know, the data can be present wherever the container runs. Um, is, you know, it's generally going to be lower performance than just um, kind of static storage on the server. Um, on top of that, yeah, I, d I don't actually know how much these things have moved forward recently, but a couple of years ago there was like an analysis of the Docker networking uh, system, and depending on which options you switch on, you can get like quite significantly reduced uh, throughput on the networking. Um, yeah, does that answer? So how do you currently run your databases? They're just dedicated machines, so dedicated VMs. We still have time for questions if anyone's got some uh, something to ask. Uh, it's more yeah. a comment on some of the previous questions and a question um, just how we handle issues of uh, having lots of dependencies and things is we've eventually just built a kind of Uber base image that has sort of all the things that any of our services might possibly need. And you do end up with a very large image, but it's only one very large image. And then we have a lot of small layers that sit on top of that. So once a particular worker's got the large base image, it's then quite small downloads to get any particular service that sits on top of that. And then for wheels, what we've done is actually in that image, it installs a whole bunch of packages and produces the wheels but then actually deletes the packages and it just has wheels sitting in the wheel cache. So then when one of the subsequent images wants to install a wheel, it's actually very quick for it to do that because it's, it's sitting in the wheel cache inside the image. Yeah. Um, yeah, there are various things you can do. Uh, where are we? There's yeah, so if you actually did a Docker run Python, the default image is like, kind of huge and has all the build dependencies you could pretty much ever need to uh, like compile any C extension for your Python package. Um, and normally we base our images on what's, uh, it's like a slim variant that is significantly smaller. Um, but yeah, like you said, once the image is there, uh, because of the sort of layered file system, um, you know, downloading the pieces that kind of build on top of that is much faster. Um, one of the things that we need is running containers in DCs in African countries which have very low bandwidth. And every time there is an update to the base Python image, we get another gig that we have to pull down at dial-up modem speeds in Uganda, for example. Yeah. Which uh, container management system you were using in preference to, or I mean, alternatively to something like Kubernetes? Um, why did you choose that container management platform as, pro as opposed to anything else? Sure. Um, yeah, so uh, historical reasons mostly, I think. Um, at the time, kind of before DCOS was uh, open source, there was Apache Mesos and Mesosphere Marathon, which is what we started out on at the time. Those were slightly more mature, I think, than Kubernetes um, and significantly easier to deploy. They had better high availability systems um, and they also had better resource management. Kubernetes did not have the same emphasis on those features. It was more automation and fancy things rather than high availability and resource management. Um, yeah, so one last thing. <laughs> sure. Um, so, I mean, I understand that Kubernetes is very young and that's sort of at the bleeding edge and that's, that's why. Um, but what is, what is compelling about DCOS? I mean, is that, that's sort of just what you were saying, of course. It was at the time you made that decision. Sure. Um, <laughs> It's complicated, <laughs> I guess it's, uh, yeah, it, well, firstly, just moving between these systems is really non-trivial, I would say. We have, like, quite a lot of operational experience with Mesos Marathon. 
Um, we also have our own kind of, uh, it happens to be a Django web app that sits on top of these things and has like a, a more user-friendly interface into them and that's quite heavily integrated with that platform as well. Um, we also just have a good relationship with the Mesosphere people. Um, yeah, various reasons. Well, thanks very much, Jamie. That was a fascinating talk, and I have to thank the audience also for some great questions to uh, clarify all of that stuff. Okay, so thank you very much. Thanks.